everyone. I'm Chelsea Pettit, Head of Arts at the Bogley Foundation. We're going live, just waiting for the artist to join us. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice. We're joined. We can see each other. We can hear each other. So we'll get started. Welcome everyone to the Open Up series for the Bogley Foundation. I'm Chelsea Pettit, I'm Head of Arts. And today we have Timur Sitchin as our guest. I'm really excited to have a really good conversation with him about his work and what's important to him today. As everyone might know by now, we started the series uh, last month, thought about it the month before, because we were going through quite an incredible time in our history and we felt now more than ever we should be talking to artists about what's going on in their lives, how they're coping, um, and really thinking about the practice, um, but also the personal and um, how they're uh, moving forward really and how we're thinking about the future. So Timur's practice I think really sits within these kinds of major points. Um, there's you know, big environmental, social, cultural, political changes going on. And I just think it's really great time to speak to, uh, speak to you, Timur, about some of these things. Um, just a quick bio for those who don't know your work. Um, he's inspired by contemporary philosophy, the evolution of culture, um, the dynamics of cognition. Uh, the, the works take forms in 3D printed sculptures, light boxes, VR, um, branded ecosystems, as you call them, which I'd love to talk about later. Um, but also he's thinking beyond anthro anthropocentric dualisms, um, which sit at the center of Western consciousness. So again, we're going to talk a little bit about what, what he means by that. Um, he's New York and Berlin based, an artist of German and Mongolian Chinese descent, but grew up in Berlin, Beijing and the American Southwest, which would be interesting to talk about some of those influences. So the interview shouldn't be more than 30, 45 minutes or so, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. If anybody wants to wait and throw in those questions on the comment section towards the end, um, I'll do a shout out for that. All right, let's get started. Timur, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. I understand you're in, Ro you're in Romania at the moment, um, so you don't have your Berlin studio behind you. Um, but I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what you have been working on these past few months. Um, I think you were in New York for a while during lockdown. Um, and yeah, if it's had a kind of impact on your practice going forward. Yeah, um, first of all, hi everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Chelsea and uh, the Bakri Foundation for inviting me to do this. Um, yeah, so I, I just arrived in Romania a week ago. My girlfriend is Romanian and she has kind of been stuck here since the borders closed in, in March. She, she, um, she came here for a visit to visit her parents and then wasn't allowed to come back. So uh, I was in New York uh, by myself for these months. And then um, finally now when things got a little bit looser uh, I decided to just come hang out here for the summer. Um, yeah, normally I work in New York and I have like a small little um, office studio in Berlin that um, uh, I have an assistant who helps me there. And um, yeah, so let's see, like I, I was working on a, on a solo show um, at Von Ammon Gallery, a new gallery in Washington, D.C., which um, was initially supposed to open in uh, April, and then we pushed it back to May, and now it's scheduled for October. Okay. And so um, I've been mostly working on that. And there's also the, uh, the Riga Biennial, which um, mm. was supposed to happen in May, but now it's uh, happening in September. So those were kind of the two things that, I, um, that I've been up to. And, but I've also been using the time a lot for writing, actually. It's, it's, it's been a nice time to, to, to write. And, and to be honest, I, I, I really do enjoy actually like the relaxed um, timelines and, and uh, with the yeah the relaxed deadlines yeah i suppose what will happen is they'll all just come cr crunching right into september october 
when things start start kind of yeah. kicking off again. But um, but yeah, it sounds good. And, and of course, your writing is is something that um, I'd like to talk more about because it seems like quite a big part of your practice. At least there's a very recent book review, which um, we touched upon, which Bugger Foundation just shared again on Twitter to have a read, everybody have a read. To me, um, it felt like it really encompassed some of the things you're thinking about in your work. Um, mm -hmm. for, for everyone out there, it's called The Ghost Dance in Untold History of the Americas by Michael Stewart Ani. Um, and you read it last autumn and wrote something for Heichi Magazine, H-E-I-C-H-I, -E mm -hmm. um, online where everyone can read it. Um, mm -hmm. There were so many takeaways from this. Uh, that I got that I felt really influenced your practice. Can you talk a bit more about how that piece came about and what those shared kind of points were? Sure. So um, actually, you know, I just found this guy on Instagram, uh, the author, um, randomly last year. And, and um, yeah, I started getting interested in, in the videos that he was posting and um, and it had a lot to do with indigenous culture and, and right away I could tell that he kind of knew what he was talking about. Um, so I, my own personal um, history is uh, at the age of eight, my mother um, got involved in Native American rights uh, issues in Germany. We were living mm -hmm. in Berlin. I, I'm originally from Berlin. And um, and my mother uh, actually um, got involved in a pen pal program with Germans, between Germans and Native American convicts. And my wow. mother um, fell in love with the man who would end up being my stepfather. Uh, and he is an Apache, uh, uh, yeah, Apache from the San Carlos Apache Reservation in, in Arizona. And so we moved to Arizona, and then I um, I grew up there. I spent my formative years basically in Arizona, and that's why I you know speak English without really an accent and all of mm. that. But um, in those years, um, I was you know very heavily exposed to Native American culture, um, and we you know we were on the powwow circuit. We would go to all the powwows. We um, went to many ceremonies, um, not just Apache ceremonies, but we traveled all basically throughout the Southwest mm -hmm. and, you know, attended um, Navajo ceremonies and Hopi ceremonies and Sundance and, and, you know, a lot of different things. So from that experience, I, you know, I could tell that this guy knew what he was talking about when it came to indigenous culture. And what was really fascinating was that um, he, you know, he was kind of synthesizing this pan-Indigenous or pan-Amerindian mythology. And that's what he's doing in this book. Like he's, um, it's not just specific to, to an individual culture, but he, he um, is able to kind of uh, tie the, the, the mythologies together in a sense. And, mm -hmm. And the you know the the truth is is there's really not a lot of people that are able to do that, and there's even you know there's not a, a big audience for that anyways. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and so the fascinating thing about the book is um, he he writes about this ritual called the ghost dance, and um, I think maybe you know people have heard about the ghost dance um in as it's known in like american history which is uh in like the 1890s or something there was uh <clears throat> there was a sort of ghost dance revival movement and uh it was a sort of last ditch effort at expelling the the white man um amongst the uh the um the plains tribes Mm -hmm. And and it was you know immediately cracked down upon like it, all of the the white settlers American government like had a strong reaction against this ceremony which is you know ridiculous but um, and it, it actually this is what led to this famous uh, wounded knee massacre in in mm -hmm. 1890 uh, amongst the the you know, Lakota Sioux and uh, and actually the the ghost dance was still illegal 
uh, until 1978 or something like that. Yeah, um, I found when you said that in your essay, I found that um, really shocking because, of course, I, I come from California and also learned about the Wounded Knee Massacre um, mm -hmm. growing up. And you never quite get the full, of course, you never quite get the full picture, the full history of where it's come from, what it meant to those mm -hmm. who were practicing it and why they were doing it. Um, but it, you also, in, in your, your essay about the book, mentioned that it's morphed into other things that we recognize now in Mexico. Um, right. Yeah, Other so the, the really fascinating um, aspect of the book is that he, you know, he points out that, or he reveals that the ghost dance is actually like a much more ancient ritual and that it has kind of been reinterpreted from culture to culture and it goes all the way back to the Olmec culture in central Mexico, like several thousand years ago. And, you know, it was kind of, interpreted from that point on, it traveled to the Toltecs and to the Aztecs and to, you know, Huichol and, and on and on and on. And Ho Hopi is another good example of it. Um, but fundamentally, he says that the, 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 the core and the essence of, of the ghost dance is really, um, is really to, is the ritual to ask the ancestors for help in maintaining the balance with nature and um and under this you know cosmology like um what he suggests is and what he says that the indigenous um people still believe is that it's really the ghost dance that's um that's going to be the thing that is able to uh, save us at this point in history and that, that the whole ritual is actually meant for this point in history. Yeah, I think that's what really resonated, I think, after looking at your work so much that there was this kind of summary of the essay at the end about the, the indigenous relationship with nature is the only thing that can save us now that we're mm -hmm. the rest of us are too late. Um, but it's interesting because I think during this period of time, especially with um, pandemics and diseases coming out that it's it, it's something that had been seen and and predicted um so many thousands of years ago via these um you know cultures who could see what we were doing to to um to our na to, to earth and to nature what we live within so mm -hmm. i think that was a a really yeah a nice way of introducing um someone to your work um through those influences and the other work that I think might be worth talking about also now is a new protocol from 2018, um, which is a VR work on Timor's IGTV. Um, you can see that uh, it's about 12 minute, I think, uh, VR work, but it really comes across as a kind of manifesto or an essay film. So again, that writing is, is very strong, the kind of points you're coming, you're, you're putting across. Um, and you say, now more than ever, we need a new spirituality. And it seems it leads to this new peace campaign you're working on. So could you talk a bit more about the intentions um, with that work? Yeah, so um, I guess going back a little bit and, and tying it together, um, you know, there's this sort of fundamental difference between Western culture and indigenous culture. Um, and, and not just Native, Native American culture, but also you know, global indigenous culture, which is that um, they, they pretty much across the board centralize nature as uh, you know, a central aspect in their cosmology and in their religions. And this is as opposed to Western culture where you know, nature is not really an actor. It's not really a character in the religious story. And so this, um, you know, through, through Christianity and through, um, you know, the whole Abra Abrahamic tradition um, and through the, the, the metaphors that they introduced, um, they, it, it sort of, you know, warped the relationship to nature and, and um, you know, made us, made Europeans just think of nature as sort of this, um, <clears throat> Yeah, as something to have dominion over, and uh, mm -hmm. it's just like um, it's a uh, it's just basically like a you know a, a, 
a room of objects or it's just, um, it's not alive. It, it basically de deanimated nature. Mm. And, um, and this I think is very difficult for Westerners to really get their head around. I mean, I think it's like easy to just like, to, to see it at the surface, but to really understand that like, you know, there are alternative cultures that really have placed nature at the center of their, of their um, spirituality and religion and culture. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's quite a profound difference actually. And, um, and the thing is, is I think that this is actually what's necessary today, you know, for us to uh, tackle climate change and to tackle the, the environmental crises that we have. Um, I think that uh, specifically spirituality and religion, um, you know, they're, they're, you can think of them, I like this term, um, uh, adaptive meaning system. So this comes from a, a evolutionary biologist, actually, uh, David Sloan Wilson, who, okay. um, who, who writes a lot about the evolution of religion, and he sort of um, presents the idea that religions are um, they're sort of environmental protocols or they're protocols for social evolution that have certain adaptive benefits and behaviors and they, okay. and they make people, um, you know, behave in specific ways. And so, um, you know, the European agricultural farmer religions, you know, they were kind of geared in that direction and it sort of lost its touch with or sense of nature or sense of, of, uh, of live nature and just started thinking about it purely in terms of resources. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas indigenous culture, you know, really always understood that there's this sort of, you know, complexity and intelligence and, uh, and aliveness. And, and also there's a sense of reciprocity with nature that, um, that is really lost in the Western tradition. So, you know, just the idea that we, you know, humans, you know, get things from nature, but also we, we, are, we owe things to nature as well. Yeah, I was just thinking that when you mention agriculture, that there is this, generally, the Western culture is what can nature do for us? What can we get from nature? Rather yes. than how can we give back? Um, yes. How can we save it? So, mm -hmm. sorry, continue. I was thinking along the same lines. Um, yeah, so, so really with New Peace, um, the attempt that I'm making is, first of all, recognizing art as, um, as a site for a kind of contemporary spirituality already. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's sort of like a secular, it's taking the role of a secular religion today for many people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we find sort of, we have like spiritual emotions when we, when we have when we see really great art or, and we have, you know, temples and cathedrals like our museums, we have clergy, which are the, you know, art workers, curators, et cetera. Uh, and we also have rituals like the um, openings, for example. <laughs> the private and, view. Uh, yeah, so, so taking that as a sort of site uh, beginning, um, then new piece is sort of an attempt to to try to build something that kind of gets these ideas across in a contemporary way like how do we how do we make a new meaning system a new protocol or spiritual meet protocol that that um that addresses this problem really interestingly for, for for me i would i would think the one thing that we haven't talked about in relation to that then is faith where where would faith or something like faith sit within this um vision you have yeah um so you know i think faith traditionally you you can think of faith in two ways like you can think of faith as in like you have faith that some sort of thing is going to happen like a prophecy of some kind um which you know i think maybe is not necessarily tenable in in most cases but uh, there's another sense of faith, which is like just having faith that there is, you know, fundamentally meaning in the universe or that there's some sort of, there's some sort of order or, or 
purpose for being alive and for for everything and i think that that's very you know that's a very difficult thing to uh to hold on to in a secular world um but i think that there are ways where there are paths where that's available um you know for myself and i think for many people like a, a sense of faith is something you get from spending a lot of time in nature, for example, you know, mm -hmm. just seeing the beauty and um, the, you know, and thinking about also scale, like the vastness of, of, of time, the vastness of the stars, of the planets, um, that I think those are, are really, you know, great sources of, of, uh, of faith, but also specifically, um, you know, um, bringing, <clears throat> I think you can get really technical on it as well. Um, if you, if you look at, um, complexity theory and you look at, uh, um, um, you know, nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory, which basically in the 70s, starting in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it started analyzing all these complex systems in, in reality. Uh, with the with the introduction of computing, actually, mm. and it basically discovered that, you know, in all of these all of these systems in the world that we think of as random, they're actually deeply structured, and they they have this very deeply deep um, aesthetic order to them, and so, um, you know, like everything from you know grains of sand to rocks and um, you know, leaves uh, to whole social systems. You know, there's this, there are these um, patterns that are occurring and, it, and it's happening at all scales of the universe. Mm -hmm. So for myself, um, you know, that has always been like a, a source of personal faith. Like just thinking that there is this, there's a supreme aesthetic order to reality and uh, it's the same order that creates, you know, all the beauty that we see, it creates flowers, it creates trees, and, it, you know, there's no, there's not even necessarily like a plan to it. It's just kind of self-emergent matter that's, that's doing it. And, um, and, you know, and also, it, you know, it's non-deterministic as well. Like it's, um, it's technically non-computational non or non-computable. So it's not something you could ever predict in, ahead of time. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's patterned and beautiful and, um, and I think that that, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do to exit that patterning. And so mm -hmm. for myself, I've always found that that's, uh, like a really tremendous sense of relief, actually. That's a really nice way of putting it, sort of what faith you have in nature, I suppose. Do you have, I don't know, faith that humanity can see what you see in this new peace campaign that that we can accept this human and human and nature being equal uh, in terms of the non-dualist kind of ideas that you propose um yeah i mean i think you know i think it will happen eventually i don't know how much how bad things have to get beforehand mm -hmm. um you know, I, I do have hope that, you know, we will be able to figure it out in some way. Um, you know, as Jane Goodall says, we have, we still have a very small window that we can jump through. Okay. And, um, and yeah, I hope that, you know, I hope that, for example, you know, even with the Corona crisis, that people start waking up and realizing that, like, you know, it's the way that we interact with nature is really just not sustainable. Um, mm. You know, they, 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 you know, the, the, the virus itself is, is a zoonotic disease that, that likely is the result of, um, uh, um, you know, a collapse of biodiversity in some region, um, mm. you know, through the killing off of some species, whether that's pangolin or not. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, these, these things are also accelerating and it's really, um, you know, we're not going to be able to go on the way mm -hmm. 
things are now. So we're going to have to wake up to it. Yeah. But, but that being said, like, I think that the, the people who are really at the front lines of this are, are indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, you know, there's indigenous people make up 5% or something of the global mm -hmm. population, but they, they protect 80% of the global biodiversity. And, um, and, you know, just like in these court cases that we just saw like yesterday or a couple days ago of these pipelines being canceled, mm -hmm. this is really because the, you know, for example, at Standing Rock, that's really the, the Lakota yeah. who, who did that, you know? And so, so we're, you know, just like I think um, Michael Stewart on me says, like, um, it's not it's not us who have to save indigenous people. It's really indigenous people who have to save us. Yeah, yeah, I really liked that that element of what you pulled out of his book. I think everyone will have to read read it now. Um, but I'm as we're talking, I'm thinking about these maybe maybe they're inherent ironies or contradictions in your work around the kind of branding and commercial devices that you use for the new peace campaign. So there's, there's images that look like, um, you know, clothing adverts. Um, and in a way, they're kind of the polar opposite of what you're talking about because consumption culture, of course, you know, is one thing that's killing the environment. And I'm just curious why you utilize those kinds of um, commercial devices for your work. Yeah, so the commercial aesthetic, um, really what I'm trying to do is so the, the first the first aspect of it is that I'm trying to create tools of cognitive access so um, you know for example with branding and logos and stuff like um, what I'm presenting is that you know these the dynamics behind how these sorts of images work really have more to do with our cognition and um, okay. they're not as we, you know, we've kind of associated them with a specific ideology. Um, but yeah. I don't think that that's a winning path, actually, because the truth is that there is not an inherent link there, that those are not causal, um, causally linked. And, you know, the reason that logos and branding has, like, taken over the world is really just because, you know, it has to do with how memory works, for example, like, when we see the same image over and over and over again, we, mm -hmm. we, you know, associate, we can store certain kinds of feelings or, or information mm -hmm. to it. And, and that works for all cultures, you know, like really symbolism and symbology is really a, a much more fundamental thing. And so really, I think that, um, you know, we have to tease apart what is ideology and what is just like how, how brains work, really. Because if we <laughs> don't do that, then we then we give then we you know give up the tools that the other other guys the other side so to speak is using um, mm -hmm. against us and so you know it's this whole thing with you know it goes to this whole thing with social media Facebook advertising um, all of this um, you know I think that, you know the scholar Yuval Harari he has this term the hackable animal. Um, you know, that we're awakening to the fact that we are hackable animals. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I think that this is really, what it does is it really, it shows our vulnerability as animals. And it, and, and I think the resistance to it actually comes from this Western, um, this Western mode of thinking where we're very uncomfortable, um, with the idea that we are animals or that, that we are as vulnerable as, as, as animals. And so, but I think that the, what we have to do is we have to flip that around and we have to recognize that this vulnerability that we have to being manipulated is actually also, is also the, the empathetic bridge that we can, that we can cross to, to other animals and to other organisms. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I think that we really need to, yeah, we really need to take science seriously and we need to take human science seriously and, and, um, and what it says about how, you know, communication works, because this is, you know, we need to use these tools to, to, mm -hmm. 
save ourselves, you know? <laughs> no, it's interesting you bring up empathy because I think empathy it would have a huge part to play in what we've been seeing. And I feel like maybe this is where the cultural and consciousness shift has happened this year. I mean, the the I remember, I think it was December or January, the burning of Australia. Um, and all the animals that were dying in the in the in the outback was joining out back because of all the fires. Mm -hmm. And I actually went vegetarian because I was crying so much over the loss of these animals that are thousands of miles away from me. But I just couldn't for some weird I just couldn't anymore bring myself to to, to eat flesh of an animal. And it became this this thing that still to this day makes me feel sick if I try and eat meat. And and I it, it is that that loss I guess and that that massive. Um, empathetic understanding of, of, of us destroying things around us that maybe mm. this year and, and the pandemic and people who've died from it this year maybe has kind of pushed that empathy a bit further. I hope, I mean, we'll see um, what kinds of changes people make, but, but it's interesting um, to go back to the kind of cognitive um, uses that you are, are kind of co-opting into your work because there's also this really beautiful high quality aesthetic element of um what you do and funny enough i imagine n nature as unruly or messy even though there's this structure um mm -hmm. but you create these extremely sort of beautiful slick objects with you know 3d and, and light boxes and i want um I, I guess i'm curious maybe why isn't it more messy or well, how do you consider these uh, materials that you're using uh, and, and why those materials? Yeah, I, I, I guess that there's, you know, many, um, there's many factors that go into that. Um, partly, you know, I'm a kind of a computer nerd, you know, grew up with <laughs> computers and, and video games and stuff. So that has always been a very natural uh, medium for me. Um, and on the other hand, um, you know, I think it's another, it goes, it goes to directly to this point, like, you know, I think in, in art specifically, you know, we have this idea that, um, you know, messiness indicates a certain kind of value system, whereas, um, you know, clean, like a different, you know, commercial aesthetics, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, or rendered computer aesthetics are, are associated with another um, value system. Mm -hmm. But really, you know, I, I want to challenge that because uh, I don't think that there's actually much correlation there. Um, and, and really, you know, we've, you know, I'm also interested in ex exploration and, and just seeing what's possible with, with images. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, uh, you know, in the art world, like when it comes to uh, aesthetics and its role in capitalism, for example, you know the the highest the the highest grossing art objects are are still oil paintings, right? So so there's not really um, that there's not really a, a direct association, I would say, between what kind of art object it is and what kind mm. of um, value value system it, it represents. Um, mm. And, and, and again, you know, this also, uh, I think ultimately, you know, it, it, it's really about like questioning what we consider as nature. You know, we, mm -hmm. we like to think nature looks like this, or it's messy like this. And, and, technology and and culture looks like this but really you know this is this is falling into that dualistic mindset uh, mm -hmm. again and really you know we have to recognize it's all nature um, of course there's specific we have to navigate within that that realm of what is nature but um, but you know ontologically it's all it's all this the same thing yeah, I think that's what I quite like um, about your work is is it's kind of multiple identities across the board, even though there's this kind of um, ultimate, I suppose, OOO background to it, that that everything is equal. We are all sort of made of similar materials. And briefly before I go on to some of the probing questions, um, I had referenced Manuel Zelanda's Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, 
um, because I think you'd mentioned it in an interview you did. Mm -hmm. And his book also very much talks about those systems in place and the kind of interconnectedness of all of all beings from the beginning of the universe to to sort of social structures now. Um, so it's really interesting. And I'm, I'm hoping maybe you could um, at some point after this send a really interesting reading list, maybe some of these things you've mentioned with Ghost Dance obviously being on that, um, just because we'd love to be able to share some of the ideas um, to help us break down this dualistic way of thinking, which I'm falling into the trap uh, very easily at the moment. Um, but thank you for that. So to get on to these probing questions, I'm really curious to know what a turning point for you in your life was. Turning point, um, I, you know, I guess just like anybody, there's been many turning points. Um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, something that I, I really believe is important uh, to talk about um, is the psychedelic experience. Um, I think that that's also really uh, going to be an integral part to, yeah, to to everything really. Um, but, you know, I, I also, I had very formative turning psychedelic experiences in my life and and I'm very grateful for them for, uh, for the effects that they had. Um, mm. And now, you know, with, um, with uh, the, the advent or, or the renaissance of the new psychedelic science and medicine that's, that's happening now, I think that this, this is going to be more um, accessible, you know, to people. And, 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 you know, really ultimately, this is a, an indigenous technology um, mm -hmm. that, um, that hopefully, the, you know, will become more widely experienced in the West. So I think that that's, that's what I would say is, um, mm -hmm. is something that I would call a turning, yeah, a turning point. But you know, you, this has been several times. So. Do you remember what? Do you remember sort of what the the outcome of that meant for you? Was there a, a sort of a, a different take on life? Did you change directions in what you were studying, or doing, or living, the way you were living, or um, any kind of outcome that you remember? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think really fundamental to it is is this connection to nature, is the realization of the animate quality of of reality of nature. Um, you know, I, I, I have a little quote that I found from some study and I have it in the book review uh, that I wrote where somebody says, and I think it really captures it well, like, you know, before the experience, I, I, um, I thought of nature as this thing, this object, like a TV that was just there. And then after the experience, I realized like, no, like I am a part of it and, and it is alive and, um, and I'm inside of it. So um, I think that that is actually the most uh, fundamental aspect of it. And I think studies, you know, they've shown that um, it does, this is a very kind of common effect that it has and, uh, and it actually is able to, you know, uh, change people's politics even uh, mm -hmm. in, in a green direction. Oh yes, I saw that in your, in, in your review um, about uh, psychedelic drugs ch encouraging people to be less um, far right leaning, which I found <laughs> kind of incredible. Um, anyway, we'll have to look into that separately. Um, another question, if you could bring back um, an artist or perhaps a philosopher or writer from the past who's mm -hmm. no longer with us um, to talk to, to sit down and interview, who, who would you choose? Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this and I, I think that actually I would, tr I would be most interested in talking to like a Neolithic pa cave painter. I think, uh, <laughs> I think that would be the most interesting thing for me just to see, you know, why did, why did these people like crawl into the dark uh, holes that are like, you know, for many hundreds of meters to just draw a picture of a horse or a bison or something on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that has had the most, uh, that holds the most mystery for me. Great, nice answer. Um, 
what would you change about the art world if you could? We haven't talked that much about the art world, except you considered it a, a new religion. <laughs> what would you change about the art world if you could? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm not like uh, super focused on, on, on criticisms of the art world, but, uh, and, and I'm, and I wouldn't say that I'm like a necessarily the biggest fan of, of the art world either. Um, but, you know, I think that fund the thing that I've been sort of working on uh, in a sort of discourse sense, which is, is this, is this dualistic um, setup. And I think that the, the dualism is still very much alive in the art world, the nature culture dualism. Um, and actually like, you know, some years ago when I first started getting into these topics, when in the environment really was not a, a topic, I think, in the contemporary art world, or it's a very small topic then. And and I started getting into topics like evolution and stuff, and, and there was really quite a, um, a rejection of that or a, a little bit of a backlash. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I think that this ultimately comes from this Western fundamental uh, um, unease with, with nature and with, with the natural, uh, and it's specifically with thinking of ourselves as animals. So mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, this is already happening. I think that um, um, especially, you know, this is what climate change is pointing to, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And it's gonna become a bigger and bigger topic as time progresses. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, what I would say, I think in, in the discourse of art, of contemporary art, um, I think that this, uh, this foundation, this dualistic foundation is, is still in there and it's a matter of that being shifted. And, um, you know, and I think that the effects are quite far reaching and maybe not always, um, um, uh, you know, easy to predict or to, um, how should I say? Uh, yeah, um, anyways, like I, yeah, that's what I would change. Right, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Sahela Silkenvari, who's a fabulous um, Iranian artist that I know. Um, mm -hmm. She says, Lucretius wrote about the nature of things. Do you feel his philosophies are still relevant? And are they relevant to your work? But that's a good question before we wrap up. Yeah, I, so I've never read any Lucretius myself. Um, I am a fan of a philosopher, Levi Bryant, and he kind of talks about Lucretius quite a bit. Um, mm. You know, that being said, uh, I think that, you know, there is a lot of wisdom that is in ancient Greek philosophy. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm personally, I think that there's a lot more room to bring in indigenous, um, you know, understandings of the world and uh, which, you know, is, is still, you know, um, how should I say? So the ancient Greek philosophy, ancient Greek culture, you know, is, is still, is a, is a descendant of the Proto-Indo-European uh, mm -hmm. culture as most of Western culture. And so there's certain, there's certain um, programs with it and, uh, and agricultural programs specifically. So, uh, you know, this is not to, not to dis, dis, disregard all, all Greek philosophy, but mm. um, I, I just think that, uh, you know, there's more room for, for non-agricultural culture actually mm, mm, mm. great well i'll just throw out uh if if anyone else has any questions to please send them through on the comment section now while i ask my last question which of course we always end on what would you save if your house or studio was on fire is there anything you would grab before you had to leave besides friends and family and cats and dogs yeah cats <laughs> family cats um people of course uh <laughs> yeah, I would probably, I would probably try to save, um, 
my hard drives, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's a very practical, very practical answer. Yeah. yeah, very practical answer. Yeah, I think what we've discovered is that there's there's not a lot of material things I think anyone thinks can't be replaced. I think in a in a day of um, in a life of digitization, a lot of um, a lot of things are, are are no longer physical anyway. When it comes to sort of photographs or things to remember things by, right? So in, mm -hmm. in a way, you don't necessarily have a lot of physical things you need to you need to save besides friends, family, and cats and dogs, and maybe your work. Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, I don't think anyone else has any other um, questions. Timur, was there anything else you wanted to talk about or say or, or anything before we wrap up? Um, no, I, <laughs> I can't think of anything. Great. Well, thanks so much. And thanks to everybody who uh, joined for what I thought was a really fascinating and eye-opening conversation. Um, yeah, it, I think it really encourages everyone to think differently, to try and break out of this sort of um, Western tradition of, of dualism. <laughs> um, and yeah, to really think about nature and our empathy with it um, and the interconnectedness of it um, and bring that into the art world in some ways. So thank you again, Timur, for joining. Um, I will just say uh, that <laughs> thanks for all the really lovely comments to everybody. Um, please join us uh, for the next Open Up series. Um, it will be in a couple of weeks, um, just waiting to announce the artist uh, ASAP. But do check back on our social and website events page to find out more for that. Um, and also note that this interview will be subtitled and available over on our YouTube channel probably early next week. Um, so do share with anyone who needs subtitles. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And thank you, Timur. Um, have a fabulous rest of your day. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.